Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In our epistle, St. Paul says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Keep your church, O Lord, by your perpetual mercy. And because without you the frailty of our nature causes us to fall, keep us from all things hurtful and lead us to all things profitable for our salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Proverbs, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come, 
eat of my bread, and drink of my wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live, and walk in the way of insight. The word of the Lord. a good thing to sing praises unto our God. Indeed, a joyful and pleasant thing it is to be thankful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem and gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals those who are broken in
A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 3 through 14. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite all the children who would like to go out for the children's homily to come forward at this time. All right. Father, we thank you for these precious children. And Lord, you tell us to come like children to you. And Father, I pray that you will bless each one of them, take their minds and their hearts and form them into the image of your son, Jesus. And may they know what it means to follow you all the days of their life. And we pray all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So uh, a Proverbs reading today. I was excited to see that. Um, This is actually, strangely, the only Proverbs reading that shows up on Sundays in our three-year lectionary cycle. So we uh, we read through the whole Bible, right? We we kind of read these highlights every three years. We're cycling through, and and it's difficult to cover everything. So our, our lectionary pulls out the highlights, and this is the one text, other than a couple saints' days, from Proverbs that we'd read. So but one of the questions I find myself asking is, why this text? Why are we reading Proverbs 9, 1 through 6 this morning? So I'm going to start off with a little context about Proverbs, about wisdom literature, and then slowly zoom in to answer this question, why Proverbs 9, 1 through 6? So Proverbs opens with... Uh, Verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Solomon is the fountainhead of Israel's wisdom tradition. We, uh, most of us at least, I I imagine, know the story of Solomon and how in 1 Kings, right, he's the son of David. 1 Kings is, he's kind of thrust into this position of leadership in the church at a young age, probably something like 15. And um, right off the bat, he starts his kingship by offering a sacrifice to God. And this pleases God. And God appears to him in a dream and offers to him whatever he would wish for. And God maybe expects something like fame or money, wealth, uh, influence. Instead, Solomon asks for wisdom. And this greatly pleases God. And because of this, God gives him much more than wisdom. He gives him great riches and wealth and success, and Solomon goes on to build the temple in Jerusalem. So, so the, the book of Proverbs is kind of the, the written legacy of Solomon's wisdom, at least one, one facet of it and probably the most well-known, most influential. The message that one receives as, as we begin reading Proverbs is that by reading this book, we too can gain wisdom. So what do we mean by wisdom? What what does the Hebrew Bible mean by by wisdom? Um, And here, by the way, I'm going to make a quick plug for the Bible Project, um, that really awesome YouTube channel that um, their their series, it's like a seven-minute video on on Proverbs, is fantastic. I recommend you check it out in general, but but I'm borrowing a little bit from from their their, uh, video on, on wisdom and also Proverbs. So the definition of wisdom, wisdom is not the law. So think of the first five books of the Pentateuch, of the Torah, um, the law, thou shall, or thou shalt not. Wisdom isn't that. It's related to that, but it's not that. It's not prophecy. So if you imagine God giving his people the law, and then over time, we're familiar with this, we disobey the law, um, we, we, we turn from God's word, um, and then God sends prophets to kind of call God's people back to him. Um, the prophets, the, the kind of, the theme of the prophets is, thus says the Lord. So you have, thou shalt, thou shalt not. In the law, thus says the Lord. And the prophets, um, wisdom is neither of these things. Instead, wisdom is, is more like the accumulated insight of God's people through generations, throughout generations. It's teaching on how to live well, live well in God's world. And wisdom is from the Hebrew kokmah. And it doesn't mean just kind of like stuffing knowledge in your skull. It's skill or applied knowledge. It's learning to live in light of the truth that you've learned. So uh, one, of, one of the prominent examples of this, and a really wonderful example, is in the Old Testament is um, Exodus 31, 1 through 3. You may expect 
wisdom to be used of someone like Moses or Aaron or some other key figure in Israel's history in, in, um, in the Pentateuch. But instead, wisdom is specifically used for these artisans, for these craftsmen who are building the tabernacle, who are building the ark, who are you know, holding the wood and crafting the wood and crafting the, the gold and, and all these different objects that are used in Israel's worship because this is an applied craft. Um, it's not just knowledge in the head. It's something that's shaping how they live in the world. The wisdom literature, there's, there's several major works, three of which are, are most important. Those are Proverbs and then Job and Ecclesiastes, but there's several other wisdom books. And, and the major theme of Proverbs being one of this, these prominent, maybe the prominent wisdom text, is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This fear isn't terror of God. It's, it's more like reverence and awe in the face of an all-powerful God. It's understanding our place in the universe before this holy God and having this humble posture before him of having this moral posture before him of, of following his moral code. So we're kind of broad level and now slowly zooming in on Proverbs. The structure of Proverbs I promise I'm getting to that question of why Proverbs 9, 1 through 6 this morning. So the structure of Proverbs, there's two primary parts. That's a bit of a simplification, but uh, for our purposes, there's two primary parts. First, you have 1 through 9, ending about where we read this morning, and this is the introduction to Proverbs. And then 10 through the rest, chapter 10 through the rest of the book, are the Proverbs themselves. So if you were to pick up the Bible right now and just read through the book of Proverbs, um, you would notice a change as you get to chapter 10. All of a sudden, there's these pithy, short sayings that seem a little unrelated. It's this accumulated wealth of, of knowledge. They may seem a little random, but it's because they're, they're this sort of reference work for us to return to again and again over the years. They're about probability. It's if you fear the Lord, your life will probably go well. It's often true, but not always true. Proverbs are not promises. There's no guarantees things will, will go right. Things could go wrong. And so the exceptions, right? So you have the wisdom, Proverbs, as one part of the wisdom literature. The exceptions to the, the wisdom of Proverbs is Job and Ecclesiastes, of ways things might not align with the accumulated wisdom. Life is too complex for simple formulas. That's why we need all these wisdom books together. So that's the structure of Proverbs, the whole book, and then the intro. The intro is where we're focusing on this morning because the intro um, says a lot about the book of a whole, as a whole and about wisdom in general in the Bible. There are 10 speeches in this introduction from a father to a son. So accumulated wisdom, right, passing on to the next generation. A father is sharing with his son wisdom, and he wants to pass it on to him. And, and woven throughout these speeches to a son are four poems of lady wisdom. Chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 8, and 9. Who is lady wisdom? She's a personification of the wisdom of God, and she calls out. She calls out to people. She calls out in the streets, in the markets. Her voice is at the heights, besides the way, at the crossroads. She stands at gates and portals. The point is that she cries everywhere and anywhere where people walk, travel, live. She, that is wisdom itself, is woven into the very fabric of the universe. In fact, in chapter 8, we see that wisdom was present with God at the very beginning of his work the first acts of old creation, before the beginning, before the mountains were shaped, before the fields or dust, sea or heaven, wisdom was there. Wisdom was beside God at the beginning like a master workman, daily rejoicing in God, and God delighted in Lady Wisdom. This is all a poetic way of saying that from the very beginning, we have lived, humanity has lived in God's moral universe. And if we want to live wisely, we must heed Lady Wisdom's call, the call that's woven into every aspect of creation that points us towards God's wisdom. 
So Lady Wisdom calls out, and she calls out to the simple, the scoffers, the foolish, those who are not yet mature. But as we read, we realize, oh, maybe there's no one else here. Maybe we're all the simple, the scoffers, the foolish. Learn prudence, she says. Learn sense. My words are righteousness. Hear my call. She calls out, and many refuse to listen. Lady Wisdom is contrasted with an adulterous woman, a prostitute who calls out everywhere and seduces the simple, who seduces all of us. Her way entices, but the prostitute's way leads to death. But if you turn to Lady Wisdom, listen to her reproof. Behold, she will pour out the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God's wisdom upon us and will make God's word known to us. If the simple seek her, they will find her more precious than silver, gold, jewels, hidden treasure. Her paths are peace. She is the tree of life. Whoever finds her is blessed and has life itself. So now we arrive at the end of this intro, and Lady Wisdom's last poem is here at the beginning of chapter 9. So the text Chapter 9, 1 through 6 itself. This is the summary and culmination of chapters 1 through 9, what we read this morning. It's the fourth and final speech of Lady Wisdom, and it draws together all the major themes of the introduction of Proverbs and prepares us as readers for the rest of the book. All along, Wisdom has been calling out from all ends of creation, heed my voice, follow my way, I will lead you to good life, But few, if any of us, the simple, the scoffers, the foolish, follow her. So what does Lady Wisdom, what does the wisdom of God do? She prepares a great feast. Wisdom has built her house, the word says. She has hewn her seven pillars. Seven pillars, we're not quite sure what this means, but there's lots of good ideas, lots of different interpretations. One is that these are the seven days of creation. In chapter 8, Lady Wisdom references that she's been present since the beginning, since creation. And so it makes sense when you hear the number seven to relate it, to connect it to those seven days of creation. So this is a grand house. These seven pillars are highlighting the grandeur, the elegance of her home, of all of, all of creation. This, this large house with this grand colonnade. You can just imagine the inside of this house house being this amazingly hospitable place. She has slaughtered her beast. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. Lady Wisdom prepares a lavish feast. Her choice animals are killed for the occasion. These are great acts of hospitality. You don't do this for anybody. This takes a lot of work, a lot of money, a lot of resources. And notice, too, that the table is set before the invitations even go out. This is an act not out of social expectation or obligation, but this is the generosity of God. Lady Wisdom sends out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Wisdom is wealthy and rich, sparing no expense for her guests, as simple and as foolish as we might be. Wisdom sends her invitations broadly to everyone, Her pursuit of those who will not listen is endless. Whoever is simple, she says, let him turn in here. This turn in the Hebrew has this sense of turning from your way to enter into my way, to leave your simple ways and to follow God's ways. You have followed the other way. You have been seduced, talking to all of us. You've been seduced by the adulteress. You may think her way is good, but look here. The wisdom of God is a lavish feast waiting for us, waiting for you. Come, eat of my bread, drink of the wine I have mixed, leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Walk in the way of lady wisdom. Walk in the way of the wisdom of God. So the main theme here is that the wisdom of God welcomes and even actively seeks us out, seeks out the simple-minded, welcomes us in. The wisdom of God makes a home for us. 
invites, invites us to turn from our simple ways and live through Lady Wisdom, throughout the rest of Proverbs, King Solomon beckons God's people to feast on wisdom, to inwardly digest wisdom, to delight in wisdom's riches. This is the summation and the culmination of the intro to Proverbs and prepares us for the rest of what comes and prepares us for the wisdom literature that God has for us throughout Holy Scripture. So this is why we read Proverbs 9, 1 through 6. But there's a little bit more. It's more than just the summary and culmination of the intro into Proverbs. It's more than just the summation of the wisdom tradition. It's more than a declaration of God's lavish generosity to the simple-minded. Proverbs 9, 1 through 6 points beyond itself because in the words of Jesus, our Lord, something greater than Solomon is here. St. Paul says that Jesus is the wisdom of God. He is the one whom God made as our wisdom. St. Paul goes on to say that in Christ, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge lie hidden. St. Luke calls Jesus the wisdom of God as well. Jesus is not only the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, he himself is the holy wisdom of God. The early Eastern church embraced wisdom as one of the chief names for Christ, even naming one of the great worship spaces, Hagia Sophia, right? Holy wisdom dedicated to Christ. The great basilica in Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. I'm sure you've seen the pictures of it. Sophia shouts the deacons and priests in the Eastern Orthodox Church as they celebrate the divine liturgy. We say the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. At times in their liturgy, they say, Sophia, holy wisdom. These are the words of Christ, who himself is wisdom. So Jesus, like Lady Wisdom, calls out to the simple, the scoffers, the foolish. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, are his words. Jesus, like Lady Wisdom, calls out in the streets, in the markets, on the hills, in people's homes, in synagogues, and he actively seeks us out. And in leaving his spirit with his people, he continues to speak and seek out people through our work, through the work of the church, by God's grace. Jesus, like Lady Wisdom, is the power of God seen throughout all creation and at the beginning, woven into the very fabric of the universe. Jesus was the wisdom of God, present at the beginning, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, the firstborn of all creation. And when we follow Jesus, when we follow the holy wisdom of God, it is more precious than silver, gold, jewels, or any hidden treasure. Or in Jesus' words, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Like Lady Wisdom, if we turn to Jesus, he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh, and we will find that his paths are peace, that he is the tree of life, that those who hold fast to him are called blessed, and whoever finds him finds life. to return to the text of Proverbs 9, 1 through 6 itself. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. Christ has built his house on earth through the incarnation, son of the virgin, hewn his seven pillars. Yes, seven pillars of creation. Yes, this welcoming place for all people, but also the seven churches of Revelation that, that represent all the churches of God the whole church of God, the seven sacraments. Wisdom has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine, set her table. The animal has been slain. The lamb of God has been slain for us. She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town to all of us. Come, eat of my bread, drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. In other words, the holy wisdom of Proverbs 9, 1 through 6 is the same holy wisdom of John 6, our gospel reading this morning. Whoever feeds on my flesh, says Christ, and drinks, on my, blood has, drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise you up on the last day. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. 
Whoever feeds on me will live forever. So why read Proverbs 9, 1 through 6 today? It's because Jesus Christ is present with us at this great Eucharistic feast and is the center of all wisdom, the center of our shared life. He is holy wisdom. He is the kokmah, the wisdom that we encounter in the Hebrew Bible, the applied knowledge of God, right, that skill and craft. It's not just an idea that we jam into our heads or we merely accept in our hearts. Jesus is the most practical of all applied knowledge. He's the very food that makes life possible. He spiritually sustains us. He fills us with the grace we need for every aspect of our lives. We, church, are the simple and foolish scoffers who, by the grace and lavish generosity of God, have stumbled into his great banquet. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I invite you to stand and let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. And together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from light, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. No end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, for Foley, our Archbishop, Keith, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, for our nation, for those in authority, especially Joe, our president, Gavin, our governor, and Robert, our mayor, and for all those in public service, especially Andrew, Bryson, Connie, Devin, Elliot, Lenny, Matt, Richie, William, and Ora. Lord, in your mercy, 
for Jacob Hooper on his birthday, we ask your blessings. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who have de departed this life in certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, additional petitions and thanksgivings may be added at this time. Thank you for Enos's recovery, for Phyllis's successful operation, and our wonderful marriage, I think. Father, we remember before you the Reverend Dr. Steve Barber as he appears to be coming to the very end of his life. Lord, I pray that you will hold him close to you in your arms of love and grace and the whole family during this time. Have mercy, Lord. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning says, Come, eat of my bread and drink of my wine that I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Father, show us those areas where we have not done so and we have not walked in your wisdom and your purposes. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I know that we have a lot of good, correct theology and doctrine in our heads, but sometimes our hearts and heads are disconnected. Please remember how much the Lord loves you, no matter how much of a mess our lives might be. When we go to him and we ask for forgiveness, he promises to forgive us and wash our sins away. Receive this new life. Receive his forgiveness. Receive his grace. Receive his mercy. I invite you to stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to All Saints. I'm uh, Father Mike, Associate Rector here, and we especially want to uh, welcome our guests this morning, both in person and online. Um, for those joining us online, we um, especially invite you to visit the Contact Us page and fill that out on our website, allsaintslongbeach.com, and uh, we'd love to be in touch with you. Either Father Scott or I would love to treat you to a meal sometime, get to know you a bit. Um, and then for those guests here in person, we'd love for you to fill out uh, one of the guest cards in the pew so we could um, get to know you as well. We'd also love to, to connect with you in person. So uh, two featured announcements this week. One is after this service, we are having a combined baby shower for the Ifland and Kim families, which will be a, a lovely time to, to celebrate them and um, help them to prepare for welcoming uh, new children to the world. So please join us. And, um, and the second announcement is next Saturday, the 21st of August, we are having our uh, Meal for the Hungry. We've been doing this throughout the pandemic, but at kind of a, a more restrained way, in a more restrained way, because we couldn't host those in need like we could before. And now we're kind of building back up to our original um, hosting capacity. We'll be opening up the doors and welcoming people here, and we need more help. Um, so please sign up in the kiosk. Oh, are you going to say something? I'm sorry. I already said half the things. Okay, you could re-say half the things. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Joyce Elliott, and uh, Robert Harrison, who attends the 730 service, and I have sort of headed up this program for many years. Uh, for, and for those of you who don't know, this program's probably been in place about 35 years. We've been doing this many, many, many years. Uh, during the pandemic, we gave to-go boxes. That's what we did, and we had a faithful group of people who kept coming. They're sort of a community here. They've been here a long time. Um, we are starting, as Father Mike said, we're going to start serving inside again, it's, which is what we used to do and what we are... Um, Mentality has always been is that we serve a sit-down meal to those people. We serve them. If we don't do cafeteria style, we, we serve them. And um, they, they sort of call us the Hilton of uh, uh, food service <laughs> because some of them won't even invite some of their friends to come. <laughs> it's the funniest thing. But um, they really, we really like doing this. Uh, what, for those of you, we do need help because uh, during the pandemic, we only needed a small amount of people to put the boxes together. But if we're back in uh, full service again, we need people who will come and help prep the food, and then uh, we need some people who will help serve the food. Our numbers are kind of small right now, so um, we, we don't need as many as we used to have come help, but we do need help once we're serving. Just so you know, for your comfort level, um, the guests will be expected to wear masks until we feed them. Um, we, uh, we'll, those of us serving will be them, will be wearing masks and gloves during that process. And um, afterwards, uh, just for everybody who may not be helping to serve but wonder, oh my gosh, you know, what's going to happen if they come in? As we used to clean the pews in here, we're going to use those same devices after that um, meal is over and everyone is left to uh, sanitize all of the parish hall as well. So if anybody is interested in helping next Saturday, we would welcome you and you could contact me or sign up on the uh, kiosk. Thank you. Let's, let's pray over this ministry and over Joyce. Lord, we thank you so much for Joyce and Robert and Carol and the number of other people who have made this ministry possible during the pandemic. Um, Lord, we thank you for the many gifts and resources you've given us, uh, financial and otherwise, much more than we deserve. And we pray for uh, continually generous hearts. As you showed us this morning how generous you are to us, we pray that you would continue to make us hospitable um, through this ministry, through th things like table groups. And God, would you work in, in various people's hearts um, as they're discerning, do I sign up for this? Surprise us, call us out of our comfort zone, 
And, um, and Lord, I also know that when we serve, um, often you're doing more work in us than you are in the people we're serving. Um, so bless this whole ministry. Bless Joyce uh, in your name, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Final announcement is um, just our uh, reminder about receiving the sacrament. Anyone who's been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, this is your table. Anyone who's been following Jesus and baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this is your table. So um, we'll, we'll continue coming forward and circling around, not doing the kneelers for the time being. And um, also, if uh, you are not going to receive for some reason, would, but would still like to be blessed by a priest, we'd invite you to come forward and cross your arms across your chest. Uh, we'd love to pray a blessing over you. Psalm 96, 8 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts.
majesty, for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. This Holy Eucharist is dedicated to the greater glory of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to your humble servants here and who are worshiping online with us, that in all things God will be glorified in us and his mission to make disciples will be fulfilled through his church until he comes again. In our gospel, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right our duty and our joy. Always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. And by the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. Our 
On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice. And we offer you these gifts of bread and wine. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And sanctify us also, fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now as our Savior Jesus Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen.
These are the gifts of God and they are for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Jesus Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
For those joining us online this morning, I would like to lead us in a prayer for spiritual communion. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people gathered around every altar of your church, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In post-communion prayer of thanksgiving, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with this spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you with faith. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The God who has called you is faithful. Go into the world with joy, forgive generously, love extravagantly, and live abundantly. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you now. 
and remain with you forever. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God.